Uh, good morning. This is another lecture in the continuing lecture series in History 1301. This is Nathan Giesenschlag. Uh, this lecture continue, uh, contains uh, comments and thoughts about the Old South in the pre-Civil War period, um, commonly known as the Antebellum period. Uh, in a previous lecture, we looked at the uh, the division points between the states and the sections of the nation. Really, in the pre-Civil War period or era, you're going to have about three uh, different sections. Uh, in fact, you'd have the North, which we've covered already. Uh, the other section that we won't cover is the West and the growing westward move. Uh, and, and some of that can be folded into the South and the North because of who settles it. Uh, but we really won't discuss the West all that much. Uh, and then today, however, is the South. As in the previous lecture mentioned, the fact that the North was uh, rapidly industrializing, you're starting to see changes take place in the, the various states up north, especially Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, and New York, New York City becoming a major city in its own right, the principal city of the United States, which it has not relinquished since. At that time, uh, the North is, uh, in a sense, uh, transforming itself. Though still very agriculture, as I, I mentioned, uh, it is different. Uh, you'll see also in the North, uh, I believe I mentioned this as well, the development of canals and railroads, which facilitate the movement of goods and supplies up and down uh, the breadth and the length of the uh, northern states, and also would join it with the southern states. So there is some uh, relationship there. Uh, but today's uh, lecture is going to focus on the South. The Southern states, uh, the Southern uh, states in the United States, uh, they uh, are going to cut their own way. They're going to be different. Uh, in many respects, they're going to stay, in a sense, the same way uh, that they were before uh, the Civil War and before the Revolution. However, it is worth noting, too, that the southern states are going to become very wealthy, especially certain segments of the southern states are going to become extraordinarily wealthy, or at least uh, uh, manifest very largely uh, big uh, uh, examples of wealth. Uh, and that has to do with the development of cotton and uh, also the, uh, the refinement of how you gin it. And so we start today with a couple of issues that I've kind of kept in, uh, uh, at bay. I haven't touched on a whole lot, but now they come to the forefront and... Uh, this is something you'd have to expect if we're going to talk about a civil war before the closing days of the semester. When we talk about the uh, southern states, uh, the southern states uh, prior to the Civil War, they were not that different from their northern counterparts. Uh, to be clear, there was uh, a larger scale agriculture down south than there was up north. Both sets of uh, northern and southern states prior to, the, prior to the American Revolution during the colonial period, both had slaves down south far more than the north, but all, uh, pretty much every colony had slavery to some degree or another. Uh, all that to say, however, is prior to the, to the American Revolution and in the first decade or so after the American Revolution, you're going to see the southern economy still be dependent upon those old products that uh, made it some money and made it viable prior to the Revolution. Uh, those products would be indigo and pitch and tar and sugar uh, in some instances and certainly tobacco in the case of Virginia and, say, North Carolina. All those uh, did all right. All those made money, and people uh, lived comfortably. Some uh, very high elite uh, plantation types, uh, they will make a, a good deal of money uh, at it. But the, the amount of money that's going to come flowing into the South, or at least uh, have the opportunity in the South, is going to take off uh, after the development of uh, cotton and the, the refinement of cotton. Cotton is not unique to the United States. Cotton is not unique to the American colonies. In fact, actually, if you look back in antiquity, uh, you'll find in India, you'll find in, in uh, South America, or at least the Valley of Mexico, meaning the Central Valley of Mexico, uh, you'll find in Egypt, and you'll find in other parts of the world, is my point, you'll find lots of different uh, types of cotton. You'll find cotton in different styles. There's different uh, species of cotton and what have you. Uh, cotton in the uh, pre-American pre, uh, Revolutionary period and even into part of the antebellum period, cotton does not look like what you may have seen today. And again, it depends a little bit on the species of cotton that you're dealing with. So if we're talking about cotton, uh, quite honestly, prior to the Civil War and especially prior to the American Revolution, you'll hear and you'll read uh, folks talking about cotton and cotton trees. Now today, if you take a trip down through the Brazos River bottom uh, or through the Mississippi River bottom or somewhere else where cotton is grown, cotton is much, much shorter, uh, more bowls per acre and, and so forth. 
But as you get into the 1700s, you're going to start, to, and especially into the early 1800s, you're going to see cotton be reduced in size uh, through just genetic, I don't want to say make it sound like it was in a laboratory, I don't mean that, but gen genetic breeding, uh, the use of certain, uh, certain seeds over others. You see the size of cotton in the cotton tree come down. You're going to see the breeding and the producing of more bowls. Uh, and on top of that, you're going to also see the production of a fiber that is a, a very uh, good fiber. Uh, perfect, no, it's not. It's uh, the cotton that America produces in the 19th century is not generally going to be as good as quality as what you find in India. Uh, Indian cotton uh, in the 18th and 19th century was generally considered the creme de la creme for a while, maybe the whole time, meaning it was the best cotton, the best fabric, the best fiber. But American cotton, however, maybe what it lacked in absolute quality was absolutely better in the amount of uh, cotton that could be produced and more particularly what it could be turned into. Uh, so what we're going to see with this new introdu introduction of cotton into the South is you're going to see it not be maybe the absolute best quality of cotton. It's very good, uh, but it can be used for the production of shirts. And that's really part of the story as well. If you're going to have a market, you're going to have a product that you want to sell, you've got to have a producer and you've got to have a consumer. And so what you see in the 19th century especially is the, pr the production and mass marketing of ready-made shirts. I mean, I've got a, essentially a cotton blend shirt on right now. It's a Dickies work shirt. Most of you watching this are going to have some sort of cotton shirt on. Uh, but prior to the 19th and certainly prior to the 18th century, cotton was uh, minuscule in Europe and in the American colonies. There was cotton, to be sure, grown in small quantities in small areas. <coughs> and there was a little bit of Indian cotton in, in Europe. However, uh, most uh, text, most uh, in say for England, for example, most clothes uh, prior to the 19th century were not produced by major textile product producers in uh, say Liverpool or Manchester, uh, but they're going to be produced uh, by homespun operations, kind of like I alluded to in the early days of American industrialization uh, in a previous lecture. And what they will be made of is not cotton prior to the 19th and late 18th century. What they will be made of is uh, linen, which is very light and breathable. It's very pleasant. Uh, if you've ever worn linen pants or a linen shirt, it's very pleasant to wear in the hot summertime. Uh, but if it's not linen, uh, it's going to be uh, wool. And so you have a lot of wool, a lot of linen, and what have you. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, is, is that cotton is, uh, is a preferable uh, product. And once you start to overcome the limitations on producing and growing and, uh, and refining cotton, as it would be, you might say, uh, preparing it for uh, textile work or being prepared for being sent to the textile mills in England and later the uh, North American, excuse me, the Northern States, the fact is, is that uh, cotton is comfortable, it's durable, it breathes well, it's a little warmer than linen, it's, it, uh, yes, it may shrink in the old days, at the same time it needs to be ironed, but that's not a big deal. Uh, cotton is just a very, very good fabric for usage uh, in, uh, in clothing. And so once the southern states, back to the United States, once the southern states figure out that they can grow cotton in their part of the world and make a profit at it, it takes off. Uh, the thing is, is that cotton can be grown in large parts of the world. It does it, it, can it be grown up north in rocky ground? No. But there's large swaths of the Earth's surface that can, because of climate and because of the soil and the rainfall and those other factors, it can grow cotton. But the southern states, starting with, say, North Carolina and South Carolina and later moving westward, it was, and Georgia, and moving westward through Alabama and Mississippi, later even still Texas and Louisiana, of course, Arkansas, you can grow cotton uh, all, not all year long, but you can grow it, and it's easily grown. It's just as very suitable for the arable land in these deep south states. Uh, in fact, actually, when you talk, cotton takes off as an industry and cotton takes off as a product in the South, you'll find that in the earliest days, cotton was grown in Tennessee to some degree. It was grown in Virginia in the primitive days. But once it really becomes a, 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 a boon of an 
a product, a, a money maker, uh, then it moves to the southern states, the deep south as we might call it. Again, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Texas, Louisiana would be examples of the deep south. Florida, not so much. Uh, Florida did not have a, the grounds in Florida were not, it were not suitable uh, for uh, large scale cotton production, never were. <coughs> but uh, these other southern states I just mentioned, they were, Arkansas as well. But so you have cotton, the refinement of cotton. You're going to see cotton take off as a, a very growable uh, product. You're going to see in the introduction of new uh, seeds uh, out of Central America, particularly Mexico, that come in and just really take the ground. So you need uh, the cotton plant. So you got one. Number two, when you talk about the South and why does cotton rise, uh, you need to have land. And the thing about the South is, is that uh, you're going to get massive quantities of cheap land, massive quantities of open land. Uh, one of the things that's uh, worth noting is, is that uh, in the afterwash of, say, the War of 1812, uh, even before it's actually over, you're going to see the uh, the the what they used to call the five civilized tribes be generally cleared out of what we at them at that time was called the old southwest today we think of it as a southeastern conference but that mississippi arkansas excuse me mississippi alabama georgia territory all that territory was held by and at least notionally owned by some of those southern excuse me those civilized tribes the chickasaw and the creek and choctaw and the cherokee and so on the seminole but those tribes, starting in the, the era of the War of 1812 and going through to uh, the Van Buren administration and even into the early 1840s, systematically uh, and sometimes above board and oftentimes below the, 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 the below board, sometimes by simple brute force, they will be those tribes will be removed out of the southeast. And or the old southwest, as they call it, we call it the southeast, they will be removed and they will be sent out westward. And some of you will think, ah, the Trail of Tears, that's just one part of the story. But yes, uh, you'll see treaties signed, the Treaty of Fort Jackson in the afterwash of the War of 1812 between Jackson and the Creek and the Cherokee and a few others. Uh, that's all part of it. Uh, you'll see more treaties signed by others. But uh, the land becomes open. Uh, and that land is now going to be clear cut in some cases, plowed in others, but it's going to be very good land. It's that land that I mentioned just a minute ago that was uh, so suitable for cotton that now can be grown uh, with cotton, can be sowed with cotton. Obviously, you're going to see uh, that play a part. You're going to see there's a in Alabama as, they, as the settlers move westward, some are big time settlers, other time, others are small timers moving to the frontier, kind of like a David Crockett type. Uh, many Texians uh, who come in the 1830s started out in Alabama and moved west during the 1810s and moved westward. And you'll see in Alabama, however, it's called the Black Belt. Uh, basically, it's through the, the heart of Alabama, say around Auburn, uh, U Auburn University, Auburn, Alabama, through that part of the state that is uh, some prime cotton growing regions of Alabama. Uh, in addition to that, obviously, when you get to the state of Mississippi, you're looking at the Mississippi Delta. Uh, up north of I-20, in a modern sense, you see that great delta region. And of course, in, in Louisiana, the same sort of thing. South of I-20, uh, you see the delta on the Louisiana side of the river. But cotton is grown in massive quantities in Mississippi. And it doesn't just have to be in the delta. It can be in other parts of the state. People will try to grow cotton everywhere. Some succeed and some fail. But cotton is very is much is is uh, is able to expand not just because of its uh, suitability for clothing and garments, which of course is there, <coughs> and the cheap the ability to make it cheaply too, I should add. But it's also because the land is available. Uh, you've driven the old the uh, old occupiers off the the Native Americans who lived in that part. You drove them drove them off. You bought them off, or however you did it, you got rid of them. And now that land is open. So now you can go westward with that land and turn it into cotton. Something else this, else that needs to be made note of too is is that cotton uh, is also going to be. Uh, uh, made uh, viable in the United States, particularly on a large, large scale, uh, more so than what you found in Brazil, uh, partially because Brazil is going to have other competing interests. I'll get to that more in, an in, in a minute. Uh, you find it more so than in India, what have you. Uh, but the thing is, is that the labor. So first of all, we've had uh, cotton as a plant. We talked about that. Secondly, we talk about the land uh, that is now available and now the labor.
It is true that the United States has had slavery since basically the beginning, at least as an English colony or whatever. Slavery has existed in many nations beyond uh, the United States, beyond the Europeans. You find slavery in Muslim nations. You find slavery of some form or another in Roman times, and on and on we can go. Slavery is a worm in the human apple, and it probably always will be in some form or fashion. But American slavery, chattel or chattel slavery, basically ownership of one to another in a full-on this is my property sort of way, uh, that is, I won't say unique to the United States, but it is certainly a facet of American slavery. Slavery uh, came to uh, the American English colonies in the 1600s. I think about Jamestown. I didn't really talk about it, but you're going to see slaves brought in basically within the first few years uh, of, of the English-speaking colonies. Slavery frankly, was uh, available in, Sp in Spanish Mexico before that, but you have the uh, encomienda system, which is a diff uh, slightly different animal, talk but there's slavery in Spain too. But it is fair to remember, though, is, is that while you do have slavery prior to the American Revolution, and it is uh, found throughout the colonies, especially south of what's called Mason-Dixon Line, uh, if you've ever heard that term, the Mason-Dixon Line basically uh, is, starts out as the border between Delaware, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. That border right there, because the Quakers generally took a very dim view of slavery. Uh, and then the Mason-Dixon line would extend westward out toward uh, Kentucky, Ohio. The Ohio River, Ohio River is the border there. Uh, in a general sense, later on, you could say north of the Mason-Dixon line was opposed to slavery or emancipated the slaves or got rid of slavery. South of it, it was common and accepted. So uh, when we talk about slavery uh, in the cotton era, and what the, the what makes uh, cotton go is is that you have a very ready supply of labor. Um, prior to 1808, uh, you could import slaves from Africa. Uh, there was a nexus relationship between uh, it's called the uh, triangular trade route, basically the Middle Passage. Uh, you'll see folks bringing uh, a finished product from uh, folks, meaning slave traders like a John Newton. If you've ever sang the song Amazing Grace, uh, he was a repented uh, slave trader. It's, his is a very famous story in the church's history. Uh, but when you talk about those uh, triangular trade routes, uh, you would see that triangular trade, at least prior to the American Revolution, come down from, say, England, go down toward the uh, toward Africa, somewhere on the coast. <coughs> and it's fair to remember that when they when they would make deals, uh, there there would be uh, finished product or some sort of wanted product brought from England or the English. Uh, uh, colonial empire or the British colonial empire, and brought to those. Uh, uh, to Africans who they'd made deals with in exchange for interior Africans. Uh, there was a great re nexus relationship, and what I really want you to understand is, is that in the, uh, in the securing of Africans to be brought to the colonies, the American colonies, later states uh, in the early days, uh, I want you to remember is the vast, vast majority of those Africans who were brought to the colonies were captured not by Europeans backing a boat up, as it were, and running into the, wil into the wilderness and grabbing a handful of uh, un unexpecting Africans at uh, Liberia or, as, or Nigeria or wherever along the African coast, and it's all up and down the coast, frankly, of Africa. Uh, there's a whole lot of deals that are being made between Englishmen, Americans, British, and Africans on the coast, African tribes on the coast, to start uh, sending uh, Afri interior Africans into slavery, which in some cases is Brazil, some cases is the colonies, in some cases, excuse me, the uh, Caribbean islands, in some cases the colonies. Uh, to be fair and truthful, uh, there are many, many thousands and thousands, if not a million or more, uh, Africans who will be transported on this middle passage from Africa to somewhere in the Western Hemisphere. Most of those uh, slaves, uh, those captured Africans, will be enslaved and sent to the Caribbean islands or to uh, Brazil, for example. Uh, and frankly, uh, from my remembrances of it, it's about two-thirds to a one-third split. So most go to South America or to the Caribbean islands. But for that third or so that do make it to, uh, to the American colonies, who do go to the American colonies, uh, it's obviously, it depends on uh, what type of uh, boat you're on, but most of those uh, boats, especially as you get around the year 1800, those slave trading boats are going to be bringing uh, uh, t uh, as many Africans as they can uh, pack onto the hull, into the hulls of those ships. 
uh, the term is what they called back then and what I've read is called tight packing. Uh, so basically you'd have some folks die from scurvy, die from some sort of disease that broke out on the ship. Uh, some wouldn't make it across the ocean, some would. Uh, most would, frankly, but at the same time you get to the, to the American colonies and they're brought in. In fact, it's worth remembering here, and this is ultimately the point of talking about this middle passage, is, is that uh, you're going to see an explosion of American now, uh, meaning the United States, American slavery in the days and years before uh, the closing of the international slave trade in 1808. Uh, you will see because of the rise of cotton and the need for labor to work the fields. Cotton, in, until you get the mechanization in the 1940s, cotton, whether it's done by mom and pop and a yeoman farmer or by a large plantation, uh, and it, it doesn't really even matter in a sense where you're at with cotton. Cotton is a labor-intensive product to uh, process. Uh, of course, the cotton gin makes it all the more, uh, the cotton gin and refinements of the cotton gin, which is a, a takeoff of an India, uh, Indian, uh, oh, I should have wrote this down, uh, Kucha, I, I think I mis just mispronounced that. But anyways, long story short was is that it's a, a takeoff of an Indian hand tool, uh, the cotton gin basically, but basically separates the fibers from the seed, and which makes it all the more uh, processable. It's very labor intensive. You want to plow the fields, you want to chop the cotton, you want to make a lot of money at it. Your product, uh, your rather your uh, not product, your uh, uh, margin is very great. I mean, you've got a, a, a great ability to make large amounts of money. Uh, all that to say is is that uh, you need more labor and. One of the facets that helps out, at least initially, and, and uh, helps the southern economy, at least for some, is that there's going to be a lot and lots of labor in the form of African slaves who are going to be brought here in the pre-1808 period. Later, after the Amer African slave trade is shut down, yes, you will have some... Um, uh, basically slave running and, and slave uh, smuggling into the country, uh, contraband as you might call it. Uh, ex easy example in the Texas uh, territory would be a, the, the very famous, at least for Texas history circles, pirate, a guy named Gene Lafitte and his brothers. They were slave smugglers into Louisiana and into Texas, uh, trying to get around that federal ban on the African slave trade. Another man who was involved, he was a small timer at this point in time, comes to history later uh, as a, a prominent man in Texas history, uh, but he was a friend of the Lafitte Pirates, and that was uh, James Bowie. Uh, he of the Bowie Knife, he of the Alamo. James Bowie made money, uh, pretty good money, and lost it all. That's the way he worked. Uh, but he made money smuggling uh, slaves in part of the time with the Lafitte uh, uh, brothers in the 1810s and eight, early 1820s. <coughs> so you get all, uh, uh, you get this smuggling in. But what I, my point is ultimately this. After about 1798, after you get the cotton gin by Eli Whitney, once you get that going, once you get refinements on that gin that makes cotton processing, taking it from just drudgery and the slow process of separating the seed out to something that moves fast and you can start sending and refining and sending to New England or to English uh, textiles in Manchester or Liverpool or somewhere there on the, on the Irish, the East Irish coast, East Irish sea coast. That is when the demand for labor goes up and you see a uh, lots and lots of slaves moved in, th thousands of slaves brought in. And really, it's also worth noting in the American experience is that during the the discussion over the Constitution, and even during the discussion prior to that, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the general consensus was amongst the Thomas Jeffersons of the world and the elites of the world is that slavery is a regrettable thing. Slavery is something we don't really like, but we have to have. Uh, I'd love to get rid of it, but I can't figure out how, but it will go away. Uh, and if we just take our time and wait, slavery will die out. Um, that's not, after the cotton gin and the money to be made by uh, growing cotton and the need for labor, that simply vanishes. Uh, it takes a few years to vanish, as it were, but at the same time, the idea that slavery was regrettable, the idea that slavery would die out was just un unimaginable after you start making bukus of money. Uh, that's not unusual. And so uh, you find by the time you get to about 1830 or so, you find very prominent men in the uh, southern political experience, a guy like John Calhoun. John C. Calhoun should have already been mentioned uh, with regard to him running for vice president and later he wanted to be president. He's also a big...
uh, <clears throat> cog in the uh, what's called the nullification crisis of the 1830s. Calhoun's a senator from Car South Carolina, and he is an easy example of the uh, of this div growing divisional split between or sectional split between the northern states and the southern states. Calhoun himself will, in about 1833 or so, you can check the date, but he will use the term, it is a positive, quote, positive good. Uh, slavery is a positive good. No longer is there that unease and that tiger by the tail sy uh, syndrome that you have with the founding generation. By the time you get to the 1820s and 30s, many Southerners and many others as well, not just Southerners, but mostly them, are going to be saying, and especially in the leadership and the moneyed class, are going to be saying, we need slavery. Slavery is good. Slavery is blessed by the Bible. Slavery, you don't question slavery. And so there's, uh, there's that facet to it as well. So you've got, uh, back to, so we got labor. You've got lots of labor, uh, commanded labor. Uh, I mean, just absolutely, uh, obviously slavery is a, a brutal subject. Uh, if you, uh, tried to buck the system, if you were a slave and tried to run away, you could get captured and whipped, uh, if not executed and beaten. And it's fair to say too, by the way, um, that, uh, with regard to slavery, I, I, I want to correct something that maybe some of you have already as a misconceived notion. There's a lot of uh, ill-conceived or uh, misconceptions about slavery is that slavery was cheap. Uh, a good worker in the field, a, a farmhand, was not a cheap man. Uh, basically, uh, a slave, uh, by our standards, our money, a slave that would come into uh, to, to work on a farm, especially like a plantation style, and I'll explain what a plantation is in a second. A slave, uh, say a young man that was tw 18, 20 years old, strong, uh, physically strong, is obviously he doesn't have a crippled leg, uh, he's got a full set of teeth at this point in his life, and so on. Uh, he's very valuable. Uh, a slave of that sort would bring probably in a modern money somewhere about $18,000, uh, roughly speaking, uh, it would cost. So if you think about a man who owns uh, 200 slaves or 100 slaves or 50 slaves, he's a wealthy man. Uh, and he's got, uh, obviously, he spent a lot of money on the slaves. Uh, depends on the slave. A, a, a woman can bring less uh, because of her what she can and can't do. Some women will be out in the field chopping cotton at times in, in, in harvest season or in the planting season. Uh, you'll also find slaves who are very valuable because they have particular skills, and this would be in the domestic slave trading market uh, that you see in the, the years immediately prior to the American Civil War. Uh, so a slave that has uh, blacksmithing skills or uh, tanning skills or some other skill uh, that has not been able to purchase or get his own uh, freedom, uh, he is very valuable and maybe more valuable than some of the immigrants you get coming into the American uh, states prior to the Civil War. All that to say, though, is, is that it's, it's not cheap. And so that brings us up to something else about slavery in the South that I want to miscorrect a misconception. Oftentimes, if you talk to students, you think uh, most students tend to think that slavery was common everywhere, that everybody, every white man owned a slave. And that's not true. In fact, actually, in the years prior to the Civil War, in fact, uh, let's just use a good year, uh, in 1860, essentially, that census, in the year prior to the Civil War, the Civil War breaks out uh, in, in all earnestness in 1861. Uh, in the 1860 census, the census showed that only about 25% of Southerners owned a slave or more. Only 25%. So if you thought that 90% of all Southerners who were white owned a slave, that's not true. And oh, by the way, in certain parts, say in Louisiana comes to mind especially, and New Orleans particularly, which was the largest city with a large free uh, slave, excuse me, a free uh, freeman, uh, freedman, I guess you could say, that's, that's really a reconstruction term, but free uh, blacks living in the city, or freemen of color live, and women living in the city of New Orleans. Uh, there were even in the South, it was uh, rare, it was about that many, but basically it was rare, but it was uh, not unheard of uh, in Louisiana for a man of color to own other uh, own slaves himself. Uh, and there is no, to my recollection and reading on it, there is no evidence that they were more uh, uh, kind uh, to their slaves than a, a white person. So, but that's rare. Uh, that's, that's my point, though, is it is rare, though it does happen. All that to say, though, is, is that one misconception is, is that most whites own slaves. That's not true. So it was about 25% prior to the Civil War. Uh, in addition to that, uh, here's another misconception that seems to be is, is that if you, uh, if you were a uh, slave owner, uh, you owned bunches of slaves. 
that's simply not true either. If you look at the part, portion of the southern population that owned uh, slaves prior to the Civil War, uh, the average number of slaves owned per slave owner is a, is a fractional over one. I have to say, though, here is the, uh, the, the, the qualification I throw in. Uh, when we talk about slavery, uh, of those men who owned over 100 acres of arable cotton land, those men who owned land that could be turned into the proverbial plantation, and let's, by the way, define what is a plantation owner. Uh, you can do it probably on acres, but traditionally the way you say who is a plantation owner, it's a man who owns in excess of 20 slaves. Sometimes you'll see that higher is, uh, for 30 is a, is a threshold for some historians, but we'll stick for this class with the old uh, threshold of 20 slaves as a plantation owner. But if a man, uh, to change up my uh, you know, qualifications just a bit, but if a man owned uh, over 100 acres, he owned 91% uh, men, rather, or women, who owned ni uh, over 100 acres of land in the South. Those men owned 91% of the slaves in the South. So you do see a concentration of slaves within the hands of a few, a planter class, if you like. And so uh, in the, we talk about this uh, Civil War and the, excuse me, the South and the, what's going on in the South with slavery. You've got, a, you've got cotton that is now available and made uh, easy, uh, to process, easier to process and, and the refinement process. Uh, it has uh, got plenty of land. You've got plenty of labor, uh, replenished uh, labor supply. Even after the close of the international slave trade in 1808, uh, you still have plenty of slaves to go around. Uh, there's a domestic slave trading market and so forth. Also it's worth noting, too, too is is that when we talk about uh, the the uh, South as far as its uh, why was it and cotton so mated together so nicely is is that you're going to have a lot of capital a lot of money initially in the early days of uh, slavery and its rise in cotton particularly in its rise is a very valuable product uh, some people have called it the white gold of the 19th century uh, meaning like the white gold of salt that I've referenced earlier in class <coughs> in the in the reformation period but when we talk about cotton as a profitable thing a lot of that southern expansion whether it's in the form of t of uh, ref gins in the reform of per in the form of purchasing slaves the purchase of land and so forth and so on a lot of that capital doesn't come from the slave owner himself Sometimes you can look at these plantation owners, you can say, my gosh, they made a lot of money, but they really weren't that rich. Uh, they spent it all, uh, or they never, they, they bought more land, and it was always uh, seemingly one step ahead of uh, the bank. Uh, and who's the bank? In the, especially in the early days, even into the 1820s and 30s, the major uh, givers of money to these uh, southerners, these plantation boys, uh, especially that class, not the yeoman farmers, but the plantation class, the ones we think of as go in Gone with the Wind. Gone, so be clear about this, Gone with the Wind, that movie is not representative of the whole of the South. It's representative of that planter class. But those planter boys who had the big houses, who had the 100 acres, who had the 20 or more slaves, those guys, they got a lot of their money from British bankers. British bankers who were loaning money to Southerners to grow more cotton, who in turn would sell it to English textiles, and then who in turn would sell these ready-made shirts of, of maybe not great quality, but certainly good enough quality. I mean, and they turn it and turn around and sell it to uh, uh, various and sundry individuals in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and beyond. I mean, think of it this way: those textile manufacturers in England. And the, what they're making there, uh, and in some respects, the story of English textile manufacturing is only just a, you know, maybe a couple of decades ahead of American man, uh, manufacturing in textiles. It's all, it, it, there's a whole lot of interrelatedness and, and descent, meaning, uh, kind of like family descent sort of thing. But the, the English textile manufacturers, they made money hand over fist off of southern cotton. Southern cotton is going to replace Indian cotton. Southern cotton, southern American cotton is going to replace Egyptian cotton, but especially Indian cotton going and feeding those textiles. And so one of the things as you get closer and closer to the American Civil War that Englishmen are worried about is, is that we are in, it's, it, we are beholden to only one supplier of cotton. And do they have us? Who's got who? We loan them money. 
We loan those southern plantation owners money, yet at the same time, uh, we can only, we're only getting our cotton from them seemingly. It's not completely true, but there was, uh, there was casting about in England about maybe we need to cast our wet not light, uh, wider. So, but that's true. At the same time, the plantation owner in the south was conflicted because he was in hock to an English bank, sometimes a New York bank, but he was in hock to an English or London, uh, London, England bank, and he seemingly is just, he's just running himself into a tizzy trying to stay ahead of the bank and stay ahead of the Joneses and, and keep up appearances and, fa you know, basically, uh, uh, furnish his house in a lavish style to lead the life that he thinks he ought to lead. It's, uh, it's it's uh, kind of interesting to look at it because you'll see both sides of the proverbial ocean, the literal ocean, I guess now, is is that one side, the Southerners, looks over and says, my gosh, I wish I was freed from the shackles of debt to the Englishman or to a New York bank. Because that's in there too, especially as you get toward the Civil War. And then the Englishmen look back and say, man, we need to get supplies elsewhere just in case a slave insurrection gets going. Uh, the Southerners try to pull, uh, they, there's something goes on in the American colonies with, say, abolition, and that destroys Southern cotton for a while. We've got to diversify our, our supplies. Uh, and so that's all working in the background. But money flowing into the South through the form of loans and investments uh, from New York banks to a lesser degree, uh, especially it gets better and bigger after you get about after 1840. But in the early days after London or English banks, that's big. That is, that is big uh, in the whole story. And the last thing that makes the southern cotton economy go, aside from uh, foreign capital, aside from labor, aside from ready land, is political strength. And one of the things, one of the things about uh, uh, Southern cotton and Southern society in this uh, antebellum period is the fact that the plantation class is going to have a, an outsized, meaning con considering their size of how many of them there are, there's not that many plantation owners, but they have an outsized influence on American politics. Uh, it's not a lock, uh, complete lock, but at the same time, you will see states and you will see federal policy uh, turned, federal government policy, meaning Washington, D.C. policy, designed to help and to aid the uh, development of cotton and cotton manufacturing and cotton planting in the southern states. Uh, we've I mentioned it a few minutes ago, but I said at the Van Buren administration, before that the Jackson administration, uh, the instrumentality, the force arm of the federal government was used against those southern uh, civilized tribes, the Choctaw, the Creek, the Cherokee, and so on. Uh, the government, or the army in this case, was, uh, was used to push them out of the way. Uh, we, you can talk about all the details, but still, they were swept out, sent out, whether it's a trail of tears or something less, uh, something less uh, horrific. The fact is, is that the federal government will use its instrumentality to help the planting of cotton, which makes a lot of money. And then on top of that, you'll see state governments do the same sort of thing. And there's always the hope amongst those who vote for and support the plantation class in the southern states is there's always the hope amongst those who are young men trying to move up, up, and up. There's always the hope that I, too, can become and move up into that planter class. And sometimes it works and sometimes it does not. Often it doesn't. But there is this political power in the form of ballots and votes, uh, officers and folks in authority, whether they're in the Congress or presidents who are sympathetic to Southern uh, wishes, uh, and, and so forth. And, so the, and, and, of course, in the states themselves or the localities, there is political power, uh, a lot of political power in the hands of this uh, Southern uh, cotton class, and that's uh, uh, going to help it out. But obviously they don't control it completely, especially as you get toward 1860, uh, there's going to be more and more antagonism between the southern plantation elite and the manufacturing elite in the form of tariffs. It's worth noting is, is that that's a flashpoint. Uh, I'd write that down is that the, t the federal tariff is a flashpoint in American politics prior to the Civil War where southerners feel like they're being put upon by northerners and the northerners are protecting uh, their interests, whereas southern plantation owners are getting hurt by these tariffs against English products. Because again, remember, where does most southern cotton go? Even into the early, even into the outbreak of the Civil War, most southern cotton goes not to the northern textiles of Lowell, Massachusetts. They go to the northern, uh, go to English uh, textile mills 
uh, and to a lesser degree in France and Germany. All that to say is that there is, uh, there is antagonism there. So uh, we talk about that, and that is slavery in a, in a very, slavery cotton in its uh, impact. Uh, it was the cash crop. Uh, it, was, it was also fair to say, too, when we talk about cotton, uh, there is other cash crops in the South after the, uh, the rise of, of cotton, but none of them hold a candle to the profitability of cotton. Even small timers in southern states like a Mississippi or Texas or elsewhere, who they themselves would never own a slave, they might rent a slave for work and help and aid in plowing a field or picking the cotton or whatever, but they'd never own a slave because they couldn't afford it. Uh, lots and lots of small timers are going to plant cotton, meaning yeoman farmers, those 75% who never owned a slave, will plant cotton in addition to foodstuffs that they can can and put away. And so when we talk about these Southerners, let's uh, move away from the story of slavery uh, and, uh, and cotton so much and talk about being a Southerner. And that can mean an Anglo or white Southerner. It can mean a, a slave Southerner. Uh, I will, let's just, uh, we, since we're already kind of there, uh, let me just talk about being a slave on a plantation a little bit. Uh, I've already kind of mentioned it, being a slave on a plantation could be very cruel. Uh, years ago, say about 75 years ago in historical scholarship, the thinking was that being a slave on a, a uh, small farm, a, one of those small-time slave owners who maybe only owned one or two slaves, could be, uh, was better and preferable than to being on a plantation. Uh, scholarship now seems to think that no, uh, because of what we can find in written records, uh, primary sources, diaries, and oral traditions, is, is that you were probably, as far as humanity is concerned and humane treatment, if you were a slave on a large plantation, you were probably more likely to be on. Uh, you're probably more likely, uh, if you were a slave on a large plantation, you were probably more likely to be humanely treated on a large plantation. Uh, those small uh, farms, those small operations, there seem to be uh, obviously less uh, individuality, less uh, isolation time, meaning away from uh, the master. You might even sleep in the same bed with a guy. Uh, all that to say is, is that there are, <coughs> all that to say is there are advantages to being on the plantation if you have a humane uh, overseer. And not all of them, of course, were. Uh, it is fair to say also that uh, in uh, southern states, uh, in southern cities, you will have in some cities, I've already mentioned New Orleans uh, once, you will have uh, portions of the population that uh, are free. Uh, Texas, after it gains its independence from Mexico in 1836, specifically forbade uh, the residence of a freed black man or a freed uh, a man of color who was free and was not a slave. They specifically forbade that in the Texas uh, National Constitution of 1836 with, uh, with an exception provision uh, that's not important here other than just, well, I'll just say it. Uh, the exception was the Congress had to allow, the Texas Congress had to allow it. All that to say, though, is, is that Texas uh, it did not want free, free men of color, but New Orleans had plenty and many. Uh, Memphis, as I recall, had some. Uh, South Carolina, excuse me, Charleston, South Carolina had some as well. Um, you will find uh, many of those uh, free men of color, they themselves will have uh, jobs and such. You'll find them in Richmond, Virginia, at, say, the Tredegar Iron Works. Also worth noting, too, is, is that when we talk about these free men of color and sometimes domestic slaves, they could be very skilled and married. Uh, their lot generally is considered to be a better form of slavery, and I don't, this is all within context, of course, uh, to be a slave in a city than it would be to be a slave on a plantation or a small farm. But you will find uh, slaves uh, who are married uh, on a plantation. A marriage could take place between a man on one plantation and a man on another. Families will be busted up. Very, uh, very traumatic, of course. Very infamous uh, in history, American history, about slave families being broken up and what have you. Uh, and it is fair to remember too, is is that if, uh, as I've already kind of once said, is that if you were a slave living on a uh, living in, say, Richmond, Virginia, at the Tredegar Iron Works. Uh, are working for the Tredegar Iron Works, you're being loaned out by, to Tredegar, which is a gigantic foundry in uh, Richmond, which will make out a lot of uh, cannon and such during the Civil War for the Confederacy. Uh, the Tredegar Iron Works uh, normally reserve the worst of the jobs not for slaves uh, because they have value on the purchase and the skill, 
but they also reserved the worst and most dangerous of the jobs oftentimes for the Irish immigrants who were in and around Richmond, Virginia. So all that to say is, is that uh, to live in the South as a, as a man of color it was a, a certainly a mixed bag and oftentimes very dark and, uh, and uh, foreboding uh, and very gloomy, of course, and, and at times very ghoulish existence because you have to live uh, with a uh, Simon Legree overseer sort of thing. Anyways, uh, so that's one. Uh, something else to consider in the South is is that uh, what was it like to live on a uh, to be a, a freeman, a freeborn male in twenty one, meaning white male. Uh, it was uh, it was a mixed bag. Like I said, most of these fellows don't own slaves. They will never own slaves. Uh, many of them desired cheap or free land. So that's also going to push that uh, envelope to go west, go west, go west. But you also will find that uh, when we talk about these uh, these Southerners who are living in the South, uh, these freemen, uh, these me, these white men who are living in the South after the excuse me before the Civil War, these men living in the South, they are um, and their families. They're going to be large families. Uh, many of them will be second and third generation settlers, uh, meaning that their uh, ancestors were Scotch Irish. Uh, those were the borderlanders we referenced earlier in the semester. Uh, they will have uh, overgone, uh, rather undergone, in many cases, some sort of uh, religious awakening, and that's actually true for the southerners, uh, southern slaves alike. I'll mention that in another lecture uh, that I'll, you'll get soon. Uh, the fact is, is that. Uh, when you talk about living on these small farms, most of these yeoman farmers were accused of being shiftless and lazy and ignorant and this, that, and the other. And that seems to be a little bit of an overdrawn and overblown stereotype. I mean, we obviously don't have any stereotypes in the day and age we live in or anything like that. I, none of us are guilty of that, myself included. Of course, that drips with sarcasm. But... Uh, there was a, a kind of a conceit amongst Northerners, especially in New York and Philadelphia, and even in amongst Southern cities like in New Orleans and Memphis or elsewhere, that those Southern rural folk were nothing but uh, basically bumpkins, uh, something of that nature. Certainly couldn't read, couldn't write, whatever. To be clear, uh, reading and writing, as far as a uh, you know, n be able to sign your own name, that was uh, pretty limited. But what you come to find out, actually, is, is that you will f see Southerners. Uh, they will, um, they, many Southerners may not be able to read and write Shakespeare, or, uh, and may not be able to sign their own name, but they could, in a rudimentary sense, read and write. Some of it has to do with the proliferation of Bibles in the antebellum period. And so, remember, most of these folks are going to be Protestant, and we'll talk more about that later, but they can read and write in that way. And something else that's worth noting, too, is, is that you're going to see in the uh, antebellum period the rise of a type of singing. It's called a uh, shape note, shape note singing, or the sacred harp. Uh, I asked, uh, I put that on the list this semester uh, to see if anybody would bite and take the Sacred Harp style, but it has a unique style of singing and, and, so, and so on. Some of the old hymns and some of the old songs that we uh, perhaps know and grew up with in, in church, they're actually just old Sacred Harp songs, uh, and it kind of goes, you see this do, re, mi, fa, so, la stuff. And so you may think, well, what does singing have to do with literacy? It has everything to do with literacy. It's hard to sing without being able to read the notes a little bit. You don't have to read a chapter and verse and tell me what key it's in. But if you're going to read the notes and, and know it, and you might even learn how to sight read just a little bit your words, uh, there is, seems to be a pretty good indication that there was more literacy and there was more a ability to read and write in the South uh, than we sometimes have given it credit for. Uh, at times, however, their diets were very limited. Uh, sometimes there's grinding poverty amongst the, uh, the whites of the Deep South, those who were not in the moneyed plantation class. Um, all that to say, though, is, is that the, uh, the South is cutting its own way. It's going to do its own path. Uh, one last thing to say about the South uh, compared to the North is the South will not have the same amount of industry, compared to the North, will have the same amount of railroads compared to the North and the outbreak of the Civil War. The Southerners, and this is true for whether it's plantation class or slave traders or for yeoman farmers or the, the occasional freemen of color, the South could manage and get around quite easily, or at least easier than its Northern compatriots, on the waterways. I've already mentioned New Orleans as a major port in the Old South. But it's also worth noting, too, that Alabama had a major port of its own, Mobile. Today, Mobile is still a major port in the Gulf Coast in the United States. Uh, 
Mobile, Alabama was uh, fed by two major waterways, one of which is the Alabama River, the other is the Tom Bigby River. You'll find other waterways, the Cumberland and the Tennessee up north in the upper south, the Red River coming down through Texas, of course, the northern boundary of Texas, through Louisiana, the Arkansas, and so on. Even if you wanted to include Missouri into the uh, equation of the uh, south, which you can uh, at times, uh, Missouri is, uh, is watered and fed by all these tributaries of the Missouri River, and they can go in... Uh, so that you can go in and you can find all these waterways that are flowing into major ports and you can get your product out to sea. One of the things that's going to hurt the South in the Civil War is they never built railroads to the degree that the North did. They didn't have to. They never had the canals that the North had. Didn't have to have. So in the term of economy, that was something that blessed the South with regard to moving product. And moving, uh, well, it's not just cotton, obviously that's the one we spent the most time on today, but other products, uh, the, uh, the tobaccos and the sugars and so forth, uh, maybe corn or other, uh, maybe hogs or beef or beeswax or whatever. All that to say is you can move it on those waterways, either through large steamboats we think of in the Mississippi or smaller steamboats or what have you. Uh, it helps the south in the economy because it's uh, ready transportation, not so much there. Not so much as far as the railroads just didn't build them. It hurts them in the Civil War, though. But the uh, South is certainly uh, is going to grow, not nearly to the same degree as the North. The South will have the growth of cities, but never to the same degree as the North. Uh, the South will have some heavy industry. I've referenced Tredegar just a few minutes ago. Atlanta, Georgia, worth noting, is also a major uh, hub of uh, railroads and logistics, uh, but never the same as the North. Uh, South will have uh, culture and so forth, uh, and it will in some respects be considered more refined and genteel by Englishmen and Europeans than the North ever was. All this to say is, is that when we're, we boil it down, down, and down, in some respects, the sections, the South and the North, have uh, similarities. But as we go toward the year, in that fateful year of 1860 and 61, those are really two years, I guess, but those years of 1860 and 61, the outbreak of the Civil War, you can see the mindset, you can see the attitudes, and you can see the outlooks, and you can see the cultures of these two sections, these two major sections of the United States diverging. And they're, they're falling apart and falling away. All that to say is, is that we're laying the groundwork for southern, we've laid the groundwork for southern wealth, and we're laying the groundwork for the coming of the Civil War. So um, it, it's, it's a complex issue. Uh, the North with its uh, industrial, coming industrialization, its massive uh, immigration, the South never had that sort of immigration, the South doing it its own traditional way, but with uh, slavery uh, now energized, uh, the, the for slavery as a labor system energized, cotton as the uh, cash crop of the South energized and rising, uh, and then of course in the outlier of the whole thing is what did the Europeans do? Um, and so all that to say is, is that uh, we, we've, uh, we've set it up and we're ready to move on and we'll get, that, uh, get to religion uh, in the antebellum period in the next lecture.